Welcome everybody to the Cato Institute. I'm Ian Vasquez. I direct the Center for Global Liberty and Prosperity. The contest between liberty and power has been going on for millennia, and power has usually won. Um, it is only relatively recently, in the past few hundred years or so, that liberty has taken root in some parts of the world, and then more recently has begun to spread. That led to what economic historian Deirdre McCluskey has termed the Great Enrichment, in which first Western Europe and then parts of its offshoots uh, experienced an explosion of wealth that enabled those societies to escape from mass poverty. The classic question about why some countries are rich and others poor has stimulated debate for centuries, and it is the topic of our guest speaker's first book, why Nations Fail, which, like the current book uh, we will be discussing today, he co-authored uh, with James Robinson. In it, they highlighted the role of institutions, that is, the rules of the game, as the determining factor in the country's progress. In their new book, The Narrow Corridor, States, Societies, and the Future of Liberty, uh, they take a, a broader view. They go beyond institutions as an explanation of wealth and seek to determine what it takes for, uh, for liberty to emerge and to flourish. This, too, is a debate uh, that goes back centuries. And it's one uh, that uh, has stimulated uh, quite a bit of debate to determine um, which factors cultural, policies, institutions, ideology, and other things uh, actually determine uh, whether liberty takes root or not is highly contentious and highly complicated. So the book today uh, will not certainly not end that debate, but it will add to it. And it comes uh, at a, at a uh, as relevant time as ever since we've seen all around the world the rise of authoritarian populism and uh, the collapse of some societies, the failure of, of some states. And this only makes uh, the work that uh, Darren Asimoglu and his colleague James Robinson all the more uh, important. But let me introduce him uh, as, as we begin. Darren is... Um, an, inst <clears throat> an institute uh, professor at MIT, and he is, as I mentioned, the author of Why Nations Fail. And he received in 2005 the John Bates Clark Medal. That's a medal that's an award given to economists under the age of 40, judged to have made the most significant contribution to economic thought and knowledge. He's won several other, other awards. In 2012, he was awarded the Irwin Plein Nemers Prize in Economics for work of lasting significance. And in 2016, he received the BBVA Frontiers of Knowledge Award in Economics, Finance, and Management for his lifetime uh, con contributions. Um, he's one of the most cited uh, professors in the literature and has contributed mightily to our understanding of the role of institutions and prosperity, drawing on literally uh, uh, millennia, uh, thousands of years of, of uh, history to do his analyses, not just for this book, but for his pr previous book and for a lot of his groundbreaking uh, papers. So with that, let me introduce Professor Esimogu. Thank you. So this picture is not exceptional. And you see hundreds of it every year in Western newspapers. It is a bunch of people protesting in the street because they're asking something from their government. In this instance, in Germany, they're asking the government to provide more public services to refugees. But looked at it from the point of view of history, it is staggeringly unusual. Most societies in which humans existed throughout their history lived without states. And 
What that meant is that they did not have any third party enforcement of laws, and a lot of conflicts did not get resolved in any orderly fashion. As a result of that, anything approaching the no modern notions of liberty, where you can make your own choices and you live without the threat of violence or imposition by more strong, by more dominant people in your society, that was never even a possibility. When finally states emerged, they were despotic states. They were a tool for those who were politically or economically powerful enough to organize society according to their wishes, exploit uh, the people who did not have political power, or fight wars. If people interacted with the state, either it was in the form of being the subjects of the state or actually running away from the state. If they protested about anything, as they did periodically in China and other parts of uh, uh, Asia or in Europe, it was in the form of rebellions to ask the state to leave them alone. But by parts, uh, by, by, by some time in the 19th century, parts of the world had seen the development of something quite different. A type of state society relation in which people felt empowered enough to actually make demands from the state. And in fact, as in this example, people were asking for the state to play a more important role, a more significant role than it had done before. Do certain things that it did not do, regulate economic activity, provide greater public services, take on more responsibilities. This is intimately, James and I argue, related to liberty. The ability of individuals to live their own lives in both economic, social, and political fashion in a way that is without the imposition of others, but with enough opportunities and abilities for them to access services and law enforcement and judicial services from the central authority of the state. That unusual event has historical roots. And this picture is our way of conceptualizing it. Of course, reality is much more complex than this, but we simplify it by representing it in terms of two critical variables. One of those on the vertical axis is the power of the state, the state's capacity or the ability of the elites to impose their wishes. Whereas on the horizontal axis is the power of society, often in the forms of norms, collective uh, action, or other arrangements, but sometimes institutionalized forms. Society, that means non-elites, regular people, to actually get involved in politics and have their voices heard. Now, the Three areas that you see this picture highlighting are in line with my very brief introduction. On the bottom part, you see a weak set of institutions and certainly not able to impose its laws, its structure, or its wishes on a somewhat organized, society that's at least capable of holding its own and preventing a very steep form of political hierarchy from emerging. That's pretty much where all our ancestors lived until about 10,000 uh, years ago. If you look at the left, uh, upper left side, there you see despotic states such as China, for example, in much of its history and even today, where states are very well organized. They have some capacities. But more importantly than the level of state's capacity, it's, it's relative power compared to that of society. Society is meek. Society is prostate. Society is badly organized in the face of a very powerful state. But it is a very different affair in the middle. That's when you have a balance between state and society. And that's where the origins of liberty lie according to our narrative. That is the narrow corridor. And what the narrow corridor emphasizes is not only that this is something that requires a balance between state and society, not only that it's narrow, which means that that balance is fragile and, and it needs to really be hit just right, otherwise you're going to get into this, the, 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 uh, the, the orbit of either the despotic leviathan or absent or very weak state institutions, but also that liberty is a process. And that is the uh, idea communicated by the fact that there are arrows that are going to higher levels of state capacity and powers of society. So society needs to become better organized at the same time that states become more capable and more 
uh, more able to impose laws, organize certain aspects of the economy, and provide public services. That is a process. Now, it is actually quite critical that all of these happen simultaneously. If the states became very powerful, that would disrupt the balance. And if society became not uh, subject to the laws or the structure imposed by the states, that would also start undermining aspects of liberty. So the balance is quite important for this. So what maintains the balance? Well, it's this competition cooperation process between state and society. And that's what we call the Red Queen effect uh, after Lewis Carroll when, uh, or Alice in the Wonderland, when uh, Alice is explained by the Red Queen that it takes all the running in this country to remain where you are. So it's a process like that that the states are continuously going to get more interventionist. They're going to become more involved in public domains, in uh, uh, public service provision, in law enforcement. But at the same time, society has to run together with the states in order to increase its own capacity to meet the challenges provided by changing economic, social, and political conditions, as well as the challenges posed by the state's increasing power. But this competition then enables cooperation. So trust in institutions, just like the uh, protest that I showed in the previous slide, is actually a recent phenomenon. People trusting that institutions are there to serve them the police or the security forces or the judiciary actually is responsible for looking after their own welfare. That's also a very recent uh, sort of idea. And that trust has its origins in the Red Queen effect because if you could not keep up with the state, you would not trust it either. Now, this account really puts not only critical emphasis on the state's capacity expanding, but the suspicious activity, suspicious attitude that society, regular people have towards the state. That's actually very, very common. If you look at uh, stateless societies, one of the very common themes is that there is a complete fear of political hierarchy. Anybody who accumulates power, anybody who tries to tell you what to do, the stateless societies have a whole range of norms to deal uh, with that and often to stamp it out, to get rid of it, because that sort of dominance they see as a threat to their liberty, however meager that liberty is in a, state, in a society without economic conditions that could enrich them, without laws, without conflict resolution, and so on. But it's also there in the critical phases of the building of the state capacity. So what I'm showing you here is one of the most important uh, tools for controlling state power that Athenians had. This is uh, Ostrakon, a piece of shard. And after Cleisthenes' reforms, the, uh, the suspicious attitudes that the Greeks had towards power, which had already characterized their earlier reforms, for example, under their Archon Solon, became institutionalized in the name of an ostracism law. According to the ostracism law, uh, the Greeks would every year decide, Greek citizens would every year decide whether to have an ostracism. And if they, and ostracism comes from Ostrakon, the, the word for uh, shard. And if they decided to have an ostracism, each Greek citizen would write the name of, uh, of somebody on a piece of broken pottery. And then whosoever name was represented most would be exiled from Athens for 10 years. And this is from the ostracism of Themistocles. Themistocles is the uh, closest thing that Athens has to a hero. He saved Athens twice. He was the one who understood first the Persian threat. He organized the army. He led the army in, uh, in an amazing battle against the, the Persians saving uh, uh, saving Athens, and then he identified Sparta as the real enemy for Athens, and he fought for that for quite a long time. But at some point, the Athenians thought that he was getting too big for his britches, he was getting too powerful, too influential, and they thought that was inconsistent with Athenian democracy, so they ostracized him. So this is actually quite a telling story, because it captures what really made Athenian democracy and the amazing flourishing of liberty that happened in Athens. It wasn't a state imposition, and it wasn't just a uh, sort of a libertarian idea that society does something. It was the, 
simultaneous evolution of state capacity and society's tools for controlling the state. Both Solon and Cleisthenes and many of the critical leaders of Athens simultaneously weakened the elite and strengthened state institutions while at the same time providing new tools based on existing norms and political traditions of the Greeks in order to get society more involved in politics. And that's actually also what you see in the origins of the European institutions that are most responsible for the evolution of liberty. So of course any discussion of liberty has to pay a special attention to Europe because that's where really institutions that uh, we identify with liberty, both economic and social, took deepest root and evolved over time. Is that because of some uh, uh, special geographic nature uh, of Europe? Is it because of its Greco-Roman heritage? Is it because of its uh, culture? Well, we argue not. What really requ you require for entering the corridor, according to this conceptual framework, is a balance between state and society. And it was a fortuitous set of events that created that balance in Europe in the Middle Ages. It was the collapse of the Western Roman Empire with its fairly well-developed bureaucratic traditions and administrative state, which actually persisted for you know, another millennium in, in, in the Byzantium, for example. It was an amazing achievement in terms of state institutions, but not one in terms of society's participation in politics. So what was different in Europe after uh, around this time was that after the Western Roman Empire collapsed, there was a power vacuum, and that power vacuum was filled by Germanic tribes, in particular the Franks, who came and brought with them their own political traditions, norms, and institutions, in particular what some historians called assembly politics. These are things that Tacitus and Julius Caesar noted a uh, long time ago, and the uh, early chroniclers of Merovingian and Carolingian uh, uh, dynasties explain. There was a very participatory set of institutions. Chiefs were supposed to be accountable to people, and they did so by yearly assemblies, for example, as described here by Hinkmar and Reims, one for elite uh, fighters and, 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 and men, the other one for ordinary citizens, and these assemblies had the power to depose chiefs and kings. They made important decisions, and they had to be uh, always part of the political traditions. And what the Merovingians and the Carolingians, therefore, achieved was to fuse these political traditions of bottom-up politics together with the traditions of administrative and bureaucratic structure, the state capacity of the Western or Eastern Roman Empire, both of them at the same time. Uh, and it was this process that put them in the corridor. But one other thing that's very important, which is a, almost a corollary of my emphasis that liberty is a process, not something that you immediately achieve when you enter the corridor, is that you know, norms have to change for liberty to flourish. And most of the norms that exist in a society, especially with its roots in either despotic uh, uh, politics or stateless societies, are quite inconsistent with lots of individual freedoms. So those norms have to change slowly as part of the process. You see that, for example, in the history of uh, uh, Indian subcontinent. India is, at some level, an amazingly successful place. It's the wor world's largest democracy uh, and, and a very successful democracy at some level. But on the other hand, in many political, social, and economic ways, it's also a failure. It has not achieved its potential. Uh, deep hierarchies remain. There's a lot of discrimination versus certain groups. Public services are very badly prov provided. Corruption is very high. And part of that is really related to the nature of society. And how does that nature of society work? Well, this is related to the concept that we call the cage of norms in the book, which is that norms create such a tight way of regulating behavior that they really don't allow either economic or social freedom. So this is uh, the case of Dalits. So the untouchables, 200 million untouchables in India, perhaps more. And uh, according to the Indian constitution, actually written in large part by Ambedkar, who himself was a Dalit, uh, there, any kind of discrimination against Dalits is illegal. 
In fact, there is a lot of positive discrimination in politics and certain activities. But if you look at society, discrimination uh, and social hierarchy are everywhere. For example, this set of jobs, these are manual scavengers, people who clean toilet latrines and dead animal carcasses. Those are probably about 5 million, at least 1 million people who are working in these jobs. Almost all of them Dalits. If you look at other manual jobs, that, uh, like household help, uh, uh, cobblers and other difficult jobs. They're almost all done by Dalits. Well, there's no law that says that, but it's a lot of the social hierarchy. So the path of freedom, if it's going to evolve in any place, it has to start loosening the cage of norms created by these social hierarchies. So one of those is actually for women. You know, if you say that, you know, for instance, uh, 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 Britain in the 19th century is already in the corridor and making progress along it, well, that's not a misrepresentation in terms of its democratic institutions. The, uh, the UK, by 1832 Reform Act, or by the aftermath of the 1832 Reform Act, had experimented with things that had not been seen in terms of relatively broad franchise, and it was going towards even broader franchise. But then you look at the situation of women, it's completely different. Women have no rights. They have no political voice. They are systematically discriminated against. UK law did not allow women to own property. In marriage, all of their property was uh, transferred to their husbands. Their husbands could decide to do anything uh, he wanted, including take the children away and throw the women out. So how did you actually get to a place where that particular social hierarchy, that particular cage of norms, got broken? Well, just like everything else that I'm talking about, you can think of it as a top-down or bottom-up process. And the reality is, really, it was a bottom-up process in turn bringing a top-down response. If it was just top-down, it would not have worked. And I think it would have looked much more like this. This is the United Arab Emirates. This is the Sheikh uh, Mohammed Rashid Al Maktoum. He's the ruler of Dubai. And uh, in 2017, he instituted gender balance awards as a way of uh, improving gender balance. These are the 2018 awards. And the thing that's remarkable is that all of the gender balance awards go to men in the United Arab Emirates. <laughs> and so that's not a very successful way of breaking the cage of norms for women. So much more successful are these. So women in the United States and in the UK, they actually fought for votes. That was political voice. But that wasn't enough. They could get, you could give political voice to women in the same way that uh, you know, untouchables, the Dalits today in India, have political voice. But that by itself is not enough if social norms don't start changing. So then the 60s was the decades in which various social norms started changing uh, with the women's uh, uh, movement trying to attempt not only their political voice to be heard more loudly, but social and economic discrimination to come to an end. So this all looks like a complex picture, and in some ways it is. And, but that complexity comes with really new perspectives. And once you understand it, it is, I hope, is a powerful way of thinking about reality. So some of the things uh, and that's, I'm going to essentially draw quite close in the next few minutes, but I want to develop one main idea. And to do that, I want to emphasize how this framework actually helps us think about structural factors, meaning changes in the economy, demography, international relations, how they affect liberty, how they affect democracy. And in that same uh, set of ideas, also talk about some of the future threats to, uh, future and current threats to liberty. Well, the classic way that political scientists, for example, think about state institutions or, or other types of political arrangements is that structural factors create favorable or unfavorable conditions. So for example, one of the most famous theses about states emerging, for example, in political science due to Charles Tilley is captured by this uh, saying here, states made war and war made the state. Well, that looks very plausible if you look at Europe. But if you look at other cases, you see that there are many states that made war, but they did not develop their state capacities. There are many states that made war, and they became more despotic. And there are a few states that made war, and they became uh, more unstable. So what happens? Well, our framework provides, I think, a novel way of thinking about it. Many of the structural factors, just like the threat of state, uh, uh, states engaging in war, when in the case of uh, Tilly, for example, he was emphasizing how the military revolution enabled European powers to field mass, mass armies, which in turn necessitated greater bureaucratic controls and greater tax revenues in order to provide the 
requisitions and uh, uh, armaments for these armies. So that you, that you can think of that as a change in this diagram that I showed. But as soon as you look at this diagram with the corridor and the different areas, you'll see that the same change is going to have very different consequences depending on where you are in the diagram. So Switzerland, for example, is a case in point where the impulse to centralize power starting from a very decentralized confederate structure was very important for the building of the state and the evolution within the corridor. But Prussia, for example, under Frederick Wilhelm uh, I and then his successors, was a case in which the war impulse made it much more despotic, get rid of all of the parliaments, reorganize agriculture under the control of the state, introduce essentially a confiscatory system for military requisitions, and so on and so forth. So the changes really depend on what you make with them and what the conditions are on the ground that are confronting these changes. And that, I think, is very important for understanding several issues. So there are many threats to liberty, not least this. We are in a world where China is a superpower, and it's going to remain a superpower with a very different political system and a very different influence on the world. But China's influence is multiplied by the fact that a lot of technologies are going China's way. For example, these. Uh, 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 <coughs> cameras are, are rec recording and being processed about what's going on in Tiananmen Square or the uh, social credit system where uh, artificial in, uh, uh, intelligence enabled way of keeping track of what each individual does and uh, 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 scoring them according to whether they are engaged in good or bad activity. So you look at all of these changes and you say, well, perhaps the future of liberty is not bright with all of these new and uh, uh, superpower tools in the hands of the states, how can liberty survive? But it's exactly the same idea as the war and the state point that I made. These are tools. The tools don't determine what you do and how you react to them. They provide opportunities and challenges and the conditions on the ground exactly uh, how you deal, how you uh, react to these challenges is going to determine in what direction we go. Are we going to go in the direction of, uh, of the Red Queen or are we going to go in the direction of the Prussia or the China where society becomes weaker and weaker and the state becomes more and more despotic? And in fact, this is not the only challenge. Another challenge is that all of the international threats, all of the new technologies also, and, and all of the new uncertainties from automation, globalization, and, uh, uh, and, 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 and new social relations require more and more from the state in terms of a social safety net, in terms of regulating the economy. And again, that raises a lot of issues. That's also not con uh, new. And Hayek was actually somebody who very much was worried about that. He was particularly animated by a new totalitarianism, and, uh, and perhaps we are in the midst of a similar one. Hayek's very famous Road to Serfdom, which became one of the most important so works of social science, was written first in 1942 as a memo to the then uh, director of the LSE, William Beveridge, because William Beveridge was at the head of a commission who wrote the, a document in 1942, which then became called the Beveridge Report and asking for a significant expansion of the welfare state. Minimum wages, national health insurance, pension system, child benefits, uh, free, uh, free meals for children, and so on. And, uh, and uh, 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 Hayek was alarmed. He thought that this was the beginning of a more interventionist administrative control of the state, and that's what uh, animated the memo, and that's what led to the road to serfdom. But in fact, Hayek's reservations notwithstanding, people embraced these uh, uh, recommendations with open arms. It became a rallying cry for every side of the British society during the war. James Griffiths, the later labor minister, said in one of the darkest hours of the war, it, in the end of 1942, the Beveridge Report fell like manna from heaven. So it was completely... Uh, the defining document for post-war Britain. It was on the basis of this document that the Labour Party came to power and implemented many of the policies of the Beveridge Report. So why was Hayek worried? Well, Hayek was worried when you look at the details of his statements, actually for reasons very similar to the ideas that we're trying to capture in the corridor. He was worried that the balance of power between state and society, I'm paraphrasing, but not too much, the balance of power between state and society would be disrupted by the greater administrative uh, 
role of the state. This means, among other things, that even a strong tradition of political liberty is no safeguard if the danger is precisely that new institutions and policies will gradually undermine and destroy that spirit. So he was saying, well, the balance of power is going to take you out of the corridor again, if I put it into my terms. But at the end, Hayek was mistaken. He was right to be concerned. But he was wrong not to see that there was ways in which society could deal with those concerns. And in fact, the society did deal with these concerns. And it dealt with them precisely along the lines of the Red Queen effect. What happened is that as the state got stronger, society got stronger too. In Scandinavia first, which actually implemented some of these reforms before Britain, in Britain then in continental Europe, democratic politics got much more involved in overseeing the bureaucracy. That doesn't mean that there weren't inefficiencies. There were inefficiencies in bureaucracy. Sometimes it went too far including in Scandinavia, but democratic politics often becoming much more vocal with the media, with civil society organizations, actually rolled it back uh, in most instances when it became much more uh, relevant. So therefore, in concluding, I think the, uh, the way that Hayek understood the challenges, but together with our addition that the Red Queen effect is there to help us, I think gives us a template for dealing with the challenges of today. Be they, they come from the artificial intelligence, the nanny state, from new, uh, new economic technologies and globalization that are increasing inequalities and asking for greater social insurance. In all cases, the key is the balance of power. If the state is asked to do more, as it will need to do, to regulate social media, to regulate new technologies, to regulate AI, to regulate data, to provide more social, social insurance, then we also need to make society stronger so that society doesn't let bureaucrats or politicians do as they wish. So it needs to have a tighter leash and an ability to monitor and kick the politicians out if necessary and keep uh, bureaucrats accountable. That depends on balance, but it also depends on exactly the type of social mobilization that I emphasize in the case of European development or the ancient Greece or the women's liberation movement. So if the state will need to take on more, we should be very careful about that, but not to roll it back as perhaps Hayek thought was the only way, but we should be very careful so that we introduce better ways of keeping the uh, state accountable. Thank you. Thanks very much. You can have a seat and then we'll ask him to comment. Thank you very much. We will hear now from Professor John Nye, who is the Frederick Bastiat Chair in Political Economy at the Mercatus Center. He's also a professor of economics at George Mason uh, University. Dr. Nye was a founding member of the International Society for the New Institutional Economics and has been on the editorial board of the Journal of Economic History. He was a co-editor of Frontiers in the New Institutional Economics as well and has been a fellow at the Hoover Institution. He's written in numerous journals, as I, as I mentioned, and uh, has, pub has written a book. Uh, one of his books is called War, Wine, and Taxes, The Political Economy of Anglo-French Trade, 1689 to 1900, published by Princeton University Press. Please help me welcome Professor Nye. Um, thank you, Ian and Daron, for asking me to do this. Having been stuck for an hour and a half in the dysfunctional narrow corridor of the DC Metro, <laughs> I, I am pleased to have emerged to speak in the freedom of Cato <laughs> about this wonderful book. I was privileged to be part of a special workshop that Jim and Daron organized in North at Northwestern on an early draft version of this book, and I'm happy to see the final impressive tome with all its improvements. Therefore, I think I'm going to focus most of my comments on extending or discussing some of the complexities left out of the book that either Jim, uh, that Daron can address or develop in future work. The book tackles a very serious question. How have states managed to thread the needle between having a state strong enough to preserve order and limiting the inherent conflicts that come with large groups of humans living together while still promoting freedom? This is a version of what I teach in my class as the Hobbes versus Smith problem. Voluntary trade, indeed voluntary cooperation in general, are mutually beneficial. But any group 
including the state, powerful enough to prevent conflict, is also likely to abuse it. And so that's one of the issues that is central to why we think of why we both need and fear states. In this book, the authors put less emphasis on development and focus more on the politics of freedom itself, acknowledging that the state capacity is valuable not only in preserving order, but in providing essential public goods that allow for proper flourishing. They do this by using a staggering variety of international case studies going from ancient Greece to modern China. In all cases, the book highlights how states often do quite a lot by promoting varieties of what are sometimes called negative and positive freedoms without, while limiting their overstepping those limits and thus limiting people's freedoms. In some other cases, underlying social, religious, or ethnic conflicts are so oppressive that only a powerful state seems capable of serving as a stabilizing agent. That variety of examples, however, is both an asset and a liability. The numerous anecdotes and asides about the narrow corridor of freedom, as the book calls the golden mean between the state and society, presupposes that one agrees with many of their readings of their pocket histories. To, to simply take a couple of small examples, was Japan just a simple matter of co-opting a brilliant member of the old military elite? Why was Fujimori's Peru not as deadly to the success of the country as Chavez leading Venezuela down the path to socialist hell, despite the fact that many prominent liberals and academics viewed Venezuela much more favorably in the decade or so previous to its collapse? Why do we not have a detailed and genuinely a look at one of the most striking and complicated but undoubted success stories, which is Taiwan? Taiwan from, went, from being taken over by a very powerful authoritarian, himself trained in Soviet methods, whose own party and own son went on to liberalize first Taiwan's economy and then liberalize the franchise and move Taiwan to full democracy, including participation by people from the groups outside the elite. These are some of the harder questions we look at. If we think about this, for me, the two big issues I want to see more about focus around two big, big themes. I don't see enough about the discussion of the pluses and minuses of many of the things that promote order and so supposedly oppress freedom. In fact, they are intertwined. That is to simply say that it was hard to remove unproductive norms and it's hard to encourage liberty misses the point. Many of these so-called rules, norms, and laws were functional. Many of them were necessary to provide the initial order that made the country work to begin with. This is a point I have stressed in my own work and in the work of my late colleague, Douglas North. And therefore, very often, the simple assumption that one can remove some of these things, whether they are private and social, such as homogeneity of preference towards nationalism, ethnicity, race, or remove government rules which pr promote the power of the military, that one can simply dial those back without causing harms to liberty itself, even if in the short run you seem to get more freedom, is exactly one of the trade-offs that makes the narrow corridor so narrow. Furthermore, the narrow corridor is itself and will always be contested. And in fact, one of the things that Ron doesn't talk about is the more the state becomes capable of trying to protect both positive and negative freedoms, the more you will run into conflict between different conceptions of liberty. And therefore, promoting one conception will many, many times come at the expense of another group. So that in the end, you will not be able to avoid picking sides. And therefore, you have to ask yourself, are you simply promoting freedom, or are you dispensing with one group's set of preferences for those of another? Let's think more about this. Um, I remember when Jim Robinson, Daron's co-author, and I were working for the World Bank in the Philippines. Jim and Pablo Carabin had been working on a paper in the troubled southern island of the Philippines called Mindanao. Mindanao is home to substantial Muslim minority, 
often at odds with the dominant Christians that lived there. Mindanao has never been fully controlled since the Spanish controlled the Philippines. To this day, there are separatist movements. There's always, there's quite a lot of fighting. There's military action everywhere. When the Americans took over in 1898, they quickly found that Mindanao was controlling it was easier said than done. And in fact, abandoned attempts even to do full land surveys and full cadastral titling because the economic and political transactions costs were simply enormous. Post-war independence governments have never been able to free the land of disputes and violent conflicts. Pablo and I discussed the paper they were working on, and they concluded that Mindanao was so troublesome because it had bad institutions and it was ruled by local strongmen, often with illegal private armies. But I said, Jim, you missed the point entirely. Mindanao has bad institutions because it is so hard to rule over the area. The people who inhabit the island are sufficiently diverse in both culture and interest that secession elements have never been cohesive enough to, be, to become successfully independent. At the same time, the central government has never had the state capacity to fully impose control with finality throughout the many provinces of Mindanao. Thus, had this often been the case that only strong men with authoritarian tendencies have tended to succeed in many local jurisdictions. I'm not saying that's the correct solution. I'm just trying to explain why a situation like that is difficult to change and why it always comes with a lot of conflicts that do not, are not easily amenable to a clear black and white solution. What are the attributes that we look at with horror that seem to actually matter? If you think about it, humans evolved from the family as the basic unit to the tribe, to the village, to larger groupings, up to and including proto-states, larger cities, towns, provinces. And time and again, the essence of these organizations was around solving the Hobbesian problem, the Hobbesian problem of disorder and, and pro promoting cooperation. But the Hobbesian problem is very often solved by the things we think of, which is at odds with that Smithian notions of liberty. That is to say, Smithian notions, which are extended by David Ricardo saying his work, say that trade is mutually beneficial. And trade with the, those who are more different than you allow for greater gains. Conversely, order is easily promoted the more similar you are to people. The more you share, share the same family background, the more you say, share the same history, language, ethnicity, religion, culture, the easier it is to promote cooperation and order. So those two things are always at war with each other. And we need to ask ourselves how we deal with this. A very important part of this is to think about even how improving liberalism often meant riding roughshod over previous rights. For example, even in Britain itself, the fount of modern European liberty, we understand that the enclosure, move, enclosure movement which turned early lands into private lands was not a pure voluntary transformation. It required, to a great extent, overriding customary and traditional rights and, and norms of many groups who were left out by the transformation. The same was true with many of the best aspects of British liberal transformation. As my own work has shown, for example, one of the great ironies is that Britain, which in the 18th century was as the instigator of the Industrial Revolution, and also the modern liberal state was also the fastest growing state in Europe by revenue. British revenues rose from the early 1700s to 1800 by 450%. No other state in Europe came close. Indeed, on the eve of the French Revolution, average taxes in France, supposedly so oppressive, were below those of average taxes in Britain. So many of these things are very complicated. Finally, whose liberalism is to define the nature of freedom? Let's take an example. Japan is in many ways one of the most civilized nations of the world today and is famed for its peacefulness and low crime. Yet much of that is tied to its de desire for high degrees of cultural homogeneity and social norms that restrict individualism in favor of a greater tilt toward collective social responsibility. Japan severely restricts immigration and is very much concerned with making sure that the Japanese notion of what is right and true are always kept primary. It is, it is difficult for me to imagine a successful Japan in which, say, a mere quarter of the population is unwilling to live that way 
and desires to reject that consensus openly. The very orderliness and freedom that Japan enjoys is tightly tied to their population's homogeneity and their cultural promotion of collective norms of behavior and punishment of deviation through shame and ostracism. All Japanese know the expression, the nail that sticks up must be hammered down. This diminishes the freedom of individuals at the margin while also lowering the likelihood of crime and disorder for the minority. Even in the United States, many of the things that we think of as liberal have led to a lot of unintended consequences. One that is near and dear to my heart is the way in which elite universities try to promote diversity by discriminating against Asian Americans. This is well known, this is obvious, and indeed we've recently had a judge that said this is actually illegal. The fact that thousands of hardworking Asian Americans, often descendants or grandchildren of Asians who were restricted in the West Coast to more severe anti-Asian laws than the anti-black laws that existed. If you look historically, many Western states still had anti-miscegenation laws on Asians when the anti-miscegenation laws on blacks were already removed. And yet that those same grandchildren could after have a harder time entering universities than the children of wealthy immigrants who may have been themselves slaveholders in, the, in Africa or descendants of slaveholders in Africa. Seems to me a contradiction of freedom that I don't think is easily settled if you think about the two conflicting needs here. Most important of all is something I often worry about as the local pessimist. Even if we say we work these things out, is modern liberty stable? Modern industrial civilization is less than two centuries old in most of the developed world. In fact, less than a century old in most of the developed world. Moreover, we are constantly reminded that this developed in societies beset by many illiberal aspects, which none of which we understand how they interacted with those earlier successes. As Schumpeter famously noted in his book, Capitalism, Socialism and Democracy, many of the cultural factors that help propel industrial capitalism to world leadership are at odds with the self-actualizing liberal and democratic desires of its descendants. Russia fell into Bolshevik totalitarianism after decades of genuine growth and attempts at reform culminating in an ineffective liberal revolution. Does the narrow corridor really exist in the long run, sustainable fashion throughout most of the world? That is exactly the question the rising authoritarianism of China poses to the world. It is exactly that which tempts many small growing countries today. Just as the Soviet model was once seen as attractive to many countries mired in poverty and rapid technological growth, China seems to say it is possible for a poor, formerly poor and weak nation to rise without becoming liberal. Will the Goldilocks era in the West of high growth and high liberty last as long as the Roman Empire? Will it even matter what our preferences are if the leaders of Western liberalism lose their virtual monopoly on military power? Much of what we have done has been made possible both because the countries that were both rich were also liberal and they were led by a coalition that was dramatically more powerful militarily than the second place. There's almost been no time in history in which the first place military power has been so dominant relative to second place and not had it aggrandize most of the world for itself. This is a, a, such a remarkable era that in thinking about these problems, which the book of Daron seriously tries to deal with and try to give us hope for the future, we still need to say, as Zhou Enlai may or may not have said, it's too early to tell. Thank you. Well, thank you, John. That was uh, uh, thought-provoking and erudite as usual. And, and, and I completely agree uh, with uh, there are some challenging cases, and, and, and each one of them has uh, a lot to teach us. But I want to just comment on two things. Uh, you know, because actually the way, I, I like the way that you characterize the problem and the challenges of the cage of norms because that's exactly what we are actually saying also. The cage of norms uh, 
is there because it's trying to solve real economic and social problems in these societies. When you don't have the states, you have to really tightly choreograph economic behavior and social behavior. You see that in surviving ethnographic accounts of surviving uh, small-scale societies. You have to really put a lot of limits on, for example, wealth accumulation and power accumulation and market transactions and how, what is viewed as an acceptable behavior because otherwise you're not going to be able to deal with all the disputes and the conflicts that emerge. But that creates a real problem, which we discuss a little bit, but it's, it's, it's a much, much bigger than our, our book or certainly our treatment of it in the book, which is, you know, you have these deep-rooted norms and they need to change. But if you were to change them, if you were to attempt to change them in a very top-down and uh, abrupt manner, it would backfire. But even more importantly, it would make the political process uh, unrooted in the existing traditions and norms of society. So the challenge is how do you make sure that you make the political process still work with the existing norms while at the same time changing them at the margin. And it's a very, very difficult thing, and that's one of the things that makes uh, the, 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 the corridor very narrow, but it's actually been done. You know, if you look at what the uh, uh, Athenians did, it was exactly this process. So all of the reforms that Solon and Cleisthenes, for example, attempted, they tried to find it and define it in terms of existing traditions and norms, but at the same time also push those norms in a particular way. For example, uh, Solon put a lot of emphasis on a existing uh, sort of uh, norms of political behavior, and he tried to sort of pass some of his laws as codifications of those. For instance, a law he called the hubris law, which made it illegal for people to act hubristically, which was sort of part of the... Uh, tensions that existed in, in this society. And the ostracism law of Clastinus is in the same way. But at the same time, he also, they also at the, uh, tried to change those norms. So one of the key things, for example, was to uh, prevent elites to be completely dominant in the social hierarchy. And, and Solon did that partly by banning a lot of uh, financial contracts, because many of these financial contracts were these sort of boss subject relation, and so he banned debt peonage and very, very many of these arrangements. And Cleisthenes, even more importantly, he tried to sort of weaken the tribal structure of Athenian politics because he thought, and it was right, that democracy wouldn't work when tribes acted in unison. So by disbanding the tribes, he actually strengthened the political participation. So those are examples that you start from the norms, but at the margin you try to change it. And it's a very difficult thing, and that's why many examples uh, like European institutional evolution take you know hundreds of years, if not even longer. And that's also completely agreed with, with John, you know, when we say the narrow corridor, we are worried about the future of liberty. Now, I'm not going to go as far as John and say the, the corridor completely disappears so that there is no possibility for liberty and the institutions that support it to exist, but certainly the possibility that the corridor is very narrow, especially with technological, social, and the political changes that happen around the world, that that narrowness becomes a real challenge. I'm certainly uh, cognizant and, and worried about that. Thank you. Thanks very much. We have time for questions and answers. If you have a question, please raise your hand and wait for the microphone to, to get to you. And uh, when you're called, please identify yourself and your affiliation. And we'll start right here in the front in the aisle, please. Thank you. Uh, my name is Mary Shirley, and I'm the president of the Ronald Coase Institute. Um, I think this was really fascinating and um, quite stimulating, and I enjoyed it a lot. Um, I have some questions, though, about your prognosis for the future, because you, particularly in this country, you uh, counterbalance the societal uh, uh, power against uh, the state. And how do you think about the those who argue that um, the cohesiveness and the institutions that support societal power in the United States are eroding. Like, I'm thinking of Putnam bowling alone, 
or those who feel that the social media is, is causing tribalism in the United States, and then declines in institutions evidenced by things like the opioid epidemic and, and uh, decline in churches and other kinds of institutions that lead to that cohesion that you say would counterbalance a more powerful state. Uh, thank you, uh, and that's, uh, okay, Th uh, that, that is a critical question. You know, in many ways, the United States is an exemplary case of institutions supporting liberty evolving from essentially very harsh conditions, a very heterogeneous country with lots of inequalities dominated by a colonial power. And there are two alternative readings of what really made that possible. One is that you know, the US set up really good institutions in the, uh, in the form of the Constitution, uh, thanks to the far-sighted uh, uh, sort of uh, leadership of the founding fathers. The second, more the sort of the Alexis de Tocqueville's interpretation is that it was a society that was very mobilized, very willing to get engaged in trade and politics, and it was that bottom-up process that was really so important, especially from the middle classes, but more broadly. So our reading definitely doesn't deny the role of institutions and constitutions, but it's much closer to the Tocqueville. So that bottom-up process of uh, participating in politics is critical, and if you take that away and if you just bank on the separation of powers or the brilliant constitution, then our liberty is really in danger. But then the question becomes exactly like you pose, well, are we losing that uh, the th sort of the things that the talk will so admired in America, and th the answer is yes and no. I think it is clearly the case that many dimensions of social capital as Putnam measures are in decline. It is also true that people are less interested in politics because of social media, because of other uh, pressures on their time. But and it's also definitely true that U.S. has become a more polarized place over the last several decades, and especially over the last few years. But it is also true that U.S. is still politically very active. Uh, you know, it has a uh, very uh, 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 assertive society that is willing to protest. People become animated by politics. They turn out to elections, even though voting in this country is much harder for a variety of reasons than in other countries. Uh, for example, we don't have our elections on weekend days like other people do, so making it very difficult for people to vote. But despite that, you know, people are very engaged in, 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 in politics. The media is very active and keeping politicians from both parties highly accountable. And, and I think those are the important things, but I wouldn't take them for granted exactly for the reasons that you articulated. But I think the question becomes then how can we make sure that we don't lose that engagement in politics? And one of the important things is to actually understand its critical role, understand the critical role of the media, understand the critical role of civil society, non-governmental organization in politics, of protest movements, and not really just pin our hopes on the Supreme Court or the separation of powers between Congress and Senate. And I think that will be a very important part of the conversation because it really would focus us on what we need to protect. Question in the back, uh, in the aisle, please. Hi, uh, Pericles. I just joined at the Cato Institute, actually. Um, I guess my question is in attempting to better understand the framework on how we define that corridor, how do you delineate state power and potentially all the vestiges um, and tools of the state from societal power? You know, just in a rough sense, how do you define that framework? Is an organization like Lockheed Martin a mix of those? Is an organization uh, like certain media outlets a mix of those things and, and the individual employees that they have? Yeah, I think that's an excellent question, and uh, and obviously the figure I showed and a lot of the conceptual discussion in the book is an abstraction based on that, and uh, and 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 sometimes the division is not very clear, and I think you know you picked look at Martin. I think that's a great example. Take who uh, highway who highway in in China or 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 Alibaba in China. Are those parts of the state or parts of civil society? And the answer is both. But 
you know, I think that is actually a very important observation because to what extent they are part of the state, which means they act in unison in a coordinated manner without putting pressure, especially pressure coming from diverse sources on the functioning of the bureaucracy versus they toe the line, I think is the critical dimension that determines where you draw that line. So to the extent that, you know, business associations, you know, even if they represent elites are coming from many different angles and many different interests and very different uh, sort of walks of life. And as such, they are putting pressure and putting barriers on what the state does. They will help society's mobilization because society's mobilization is decidedly multifaceted. It's not just voting. It's not just media. It's not just protests. It's also a lot of these things that work through uh, organizations uh, in uh, uh, outside of the state. But to the extent that they become captured and organic linked to the state, then they lose that flexibility and they in fact become perhaps uh, in this framework you would say part of the state. So, so I think that distinction is something that will work out differently in different societies depending on this balance of power between these organizations and the state itself. Take a question in front, right here. Thank you. My name is Said Salih Kaymakçı. I'm a PhD candidate in history at Georgetown University here in DC. So my question is about like the politics and history tells us, you know, when you look at the European history, it's not the most participatory like states which survived or which succeed, which became successful. Like if you look at Poland, if you look at Venice, the Ottoman 17th, 18th centuries, they were decentralized, very participatory, but like this meant that in the world of absolutist continental European states, they collapsed or they had to go through like 19th century absolutist authoritarian modernization to survive a little bit. So, and England, if it was in the continental Europe, it would have been collapsed, you know, it would have collapsed long time ago without a standing army of 400,000 soldiers, like of, of Louis XIV, you know, absolutist king, it would be collapsing. And these absolutist states later, even if they were democratized and opened up, they had problematic aspects, right? So Prussia led to like in a kind of Nazi Germany. Today in France, like even the, Parents of like a Muslim immigrant cannot wear headscarf in school trips. Like, what is this, your que well, let's question? Let's get to the question. This, yeah, so yeah, the, like, something like China. So the a country like China. Uh, so I mean, it accumulates power, and to match up that power, you might need need to become like China. So and then, which means giving up all your freedoms and liberty in you know that you enjoy in America. We all of us are enjoying. So how to match like just Chinese power? You, do you think it's sustainable? And so do we need to really give up all our like you know? Freedoms and liberty to stand with them, or it's inevitable that they will take over and just, you know. <laughs> so, this is my question. So, thank you uh, for your question. I mean, it actually intersects with something that John said, and I didn't have time to react to it. I didn't want to go on longer. And, and you know, uh, I think, you know, one of the driving forces of our framework and one of the motivations for us to write the book was exactly that we thought the sort of ideas that were becoming popular in the, uh, in, in, in the aftermath of the collapse of communism in the 1990s, such as you know, the end of history where all countries somehow will be subject to powerful forces that are all gonna converge to the same sort of uh, uh, Western liberal type of market and political institutions, or today, you know, AI and uh, internet and the big brother is coming, so we're all going to be heading to a brave new world. We think all of these perspectives are limited. So the, uh, there are different ways of organizing society with, which are self-replicating, meaning they are they tend to be stable, they tend to find uh, ways of reasserting the balance that actually brings them uh, uh, into existence in the first place, but they have wildly different implications for liberty. They are perhaps capable of generating economic growth, but the nature of economic growth that they generate is widely different as well. So in that sense, you know, the despotic leviathan of the Chinese sort is stable. There is no, you know, contrary to the hopes that many Westerners had when trade with China first started, there's not going to be an easy process where China is seamlessly going to transition. And in fact, if you, if you look at over the last, you know, half decade after Xi Jinping's rise to power, China has become even, even more despotic and the sort of the checks on 
personal rule and uh, party uh, uh, factions, etc., they've all disappeared. And media freedom has been even further curtailed. Academic freedom has been further curtailed. But that doesn't have immediate implications for economic growth collapsing, but it has very severe implications for liberty. It has very severe implications for the nature of economic growth. The government now needs to shoulder more and more because with you know, the firmer hand of the government, the room for autonomous organizations in society outside of the state becomes less and less uh, uh, feasible. But in that, in that same way, the corridor itself, as long as it can use the Red Queen effect, is, uh, is capable of uh, sustaining that balance. And, and I think there are many ways of looking at that, but one, the simplest one, again, going back to AI, you know, there are many ways of using AI technology. And there are many ways of keeping states accountable when they are using AI technology. So I think every Western nation, in their imperfect ways, are trying to find ways of it. And I think in the US, probably we are behind the curve in terms of having that debate. And, uh, and I think the critical thing comes again to, is society capable of controlling and monitoring uh, uh, monitoring the, what the state is doing with the technology. So in the book, we briefly mentioned the Danish case. For example, the, 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 the Danish citizens are more willing to let the government use AI technologies and, and even monitoring technologies to uh, snoop and, uh, and listen to phone calls or met, analyze the metadata because they believe, not completely irrationally, that their security services are uh, accountable to the politician and the politicians are accountable to themselves. So their reactions when people challenge them about why you're not bothered about uh, the state's ability to listen to your phone calls, they say, the state's not going to abuse that and if they did, we're going to kick them out of power. So, so that sort of gives us a model. So if we are strong enough democratically and if we trust that you know, our representatives are, and our bureaucrats are not going to go behind our back and start undermining that democracy, there are many ways in which we can use these new technology and it doesn't need to be just the way of the, uh, of the nanny state or the, or the all-seeing state. And I think those are actually the discussions that we need to have and it intersects with the previous question, you know, how can we make sure that society in the form of its civil society organizations, media, non-governmental structures gets engaged in that debate? Next question from uh, Andre, please. Andre Larion of Cato Institute. Darren, could you talk a little bit about the charts that are using often in the book? It's probably one of the most uh, often used instruments. This chart about this power of state and power of society with this corridor that you used for the title of the book. Just could you explain a little bit the, the essence of this chart? How, for example, you would measure power of the state, and what kind of indicators would the measure? How would you measure power of society? How are you coming to this idea of corridors and who is falling into the corridor, who is falling into the areas outside the corridor, and so on? And in the, some particular areas, there is no corridor. It's just line. So yes. what, uh, what this particular territory means. And also, just it's maybe kind of a little bit challenge or joke, uh, Ali Baba and Huawei, that you have mentioned that uh, either neither state or nor society or both state and society, is a, are they falling into this narrow corridor of freedom they're talking about? No, it just, uh, just give you idea. Just could you explain a little bit this instrument? Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, thanks for asking me to expand on that. Uh, obviously, as I said in the talk, it's an abstraction, and uh, it certainly abstracts from several things. And, uh, and the most important one, for example, of this con conflict within society. And when we go into the details of each country's history, you know, even though we're not, you know, we're not trying to write a historical treatise on any of the countries, it is impossible to sell the story without those within country conflicts. In the US, without between states, uh, between slaveholders and non-slaveholders, between uh, the, 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 the rich and the less rich, and so on. So all of these conflicts have to be part of the debate. But we think that there are two axes that are really very important in understanding the evolution of uh, of, 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 of state structures, and that's why those two axes are power of state and power of society. So what are they? So by power of state, we essentially mean uh, 
all of the institutional capabilities of the state to impose its various types of wishes on society. So for example, the political sociologist Michael Mann distinguishes between despotic power, infrastructural power, military power, administrative power. So all of these are part of our power of society. So some societies will be very powerful, some states are going to be very powerful because they have a lot of military might, but on the other hand, their ability to, for example, uh, resolve disputes away from the capital will be very limited. Some other societies will have what, uh, some other states will have what Mann calls infrastructural power, which means that it's, the state is everywhere. You go to villages, it's everywhere. So part of the reason why under Mao, the Chinese state actually expanded its, uh, its presence was exactly because the, uh, the Chinese empire, especially under the Qing, was not present in much of the country and it sort of spread into the villages in the form of the Communist Party. The power of society, on the other hand, is a mixture of institutions and norms. When you look at small-scale societies like the TIV or, the, or uh, 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 that, we, that we discuss, or the Yoruba, uh, you know, it, their, their power often comes from norms. There are norms that don't let anybody accumulate too much power. There are politically egalitarian that ban certain types of behavior. But then, if you want to go beyond a certain level of society's organization, you need to institutionalize those powers. So when you come to, say, uh, 19th century Britain or uh, France, a lot of the power of society still has, uh, has, has, has norms at its root, but has been institutionalized. It takes the form of people voting, getting organized in political parties, uh, more structured ways of organizations such as civil society organizations. So it's this institutionalization of power is critical. And that is also related to your question when you look at the figure there at the bottom left bottom corner, the narrow corridor disappears. Why isn't there a corridor there? That's exactly related to this. If you have no institutional basis for society to get involved in politics, uh, and, 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 uh, and the bureaucratic structures of the state are also very weak, then the corridor disappears because you really need this sort of both of them to work together for the corridor to exist. So in other words, if you go to small scale societies, they can collapse and make way for the despotic power of a leader. And, and in history, they have done that many times, but they're not gonna be able to engineer a balance between state and society without some of those institutional prerequisites to develop. So what enabled, for example, the Athenian uh, transition into uh, the corridor was precisely that there were already some institutions, some elite institutions that had mobilized elites to make some consensual decisions. There were already some bureaucratic structures in Greece, and, uh, uh, and, and, and those were the tools that then uh, reformers such as Solon used in order to change uh, 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 institutions in a more fundamental way. Question right here in the, in the aisle. Hi, uh, I'm a researcher at the Charter Cities Institute here in DC. Um, so the book seems to be premised on um, this trend in centralization from pre-modern times to the current day. Um, but I'd ask you to comment on the more recent trend towards political decentralization in the last few decades, especially since like this so-called third wave of democratization in the 1990s and decentralization is a potential, I guess, solution to this problem of increasing despotic centralization? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And, and obviously these issues play out both at the national and local politics and the interaction of the national and the local elements is a very challenging one, which we don't <coughs> talk a lot about. But if you look at many examples of successful transitions into the narrow corridor, they really start at the local level. So, uh, so the federal structure of the U.S. state was very important uh, uh, for, for what happened starting in the 18th century in the United States. If you look at Britain, you know, some historians tell the story of the evolution of British institutions from the monarchs and the Henry VII and Henry VIII. Those are not unimportant, but as we emphasize in the book, equally important is that actually there were a lot of self-governing impulses at the local level. People got together, they wrote their own constitutions, they started uh, uh, providing their own public services, they started uh, helping the national uh, law enforcement uh, organizations by doing things on the ground because the national element was so weak. Uh, 
So all of those are very important historically, and they're important today. You know, uh, you can uh, you cannot reform a country like Nigeria starting from top down. So you have to do it from the bottom up, and they're very successful cases. We discussed, for example, Lagos. Again, it starts from the bottom up. So how is that bottom up possible? Well, if you don't have some degree of decentralization, meaning local mayors, local politicians making decisions, you couldn't do that. Because the critical thing is, again, to enable society and state capacity to expand together. Therefore, society needs to trust the mayor or to trust the person who's making the decisions. That bond needs to be formed political participation in the decisions needs to be done. And without some degree of decentralization, that's very difficult. But then again, if you go overboard with decentralization, then you cannot provide any of the national public goods that are important for other aspects. So that's why it's sort of a balance. And I think it's, uh, it's something that requires a treatise, a book in and of itself. And John probably will have more to say on that. Well, since it's running out of time, could I ask, could I push you on one point? Please. That you don't talk enough about the military. Your example is Athens. And yet my reading of history is that Athens is a failure mm -hmm. on two grounds. Mm -hmm. One is that um, it didn't last and it was defeated very easily by the Romans mm -hmm. to some extent. Yes, Macedonians. But, Macedonians, Macedonians, actually. Yes. But more important than that, even in their height, Athens depended upon Sparta. So to say that they were successful in promoting liberty while depending on the military arm being an extremely illiberal state, Sparta, seems to be relevant. And it's especially relevant because today, many of the groups that argue for their form of democracy are Europeans. And Europeans are very proud of what they do and often contemptuous of US barbarians. Yes. And yet nothing, none of the reforms in Denmark or Europe would be possible without the military arm of the United States. So if one wants to talk about a solution to the narrow corridor, they need to postulate a solution that also shows how they would have won the Cold War without the United States. In the, so so I, I think that, why do I say that? Because it's very important that are these solutions we have seen in the last 50 years solutions, or are they forms of free riding that let you live in the dream time when you don't have to confront power in much the same way that in the 1930s. We must remember that the isolation of the United States and the fact that the British, even you know, what's the Oxford Union famous debate saying we will not fight for king and country, that this encouraged fascist elements around the world. There's a beautiful book, 1941, by a Japanese historian, Eri Hota, who discussed the question of how did the Japanese, who all their advisors said that they had no chance against the United States. Why did they declare war? And the perception was the US had backed down on so many small things. They did not believe that the US was willing to fight if that meant the loss of hundreds of thousands of American lives. And so you always have this question that if you are not willing to show you're willing to be a barbarian at some margins, you will lose. And it seems to me most of the current debates about reform of liberty never take this question seriously. I, I am completely on board with your emphasis that there is a military dimension here, which we have avoided, okay. and, uh, and, and, and I think it's a complex one. You're absolutely right that one way in which societies in the corridor, as well as societies outside the corridor, come to an end is that they get invaded. And it's a completely different set of dynamics, I think, throughout history, <coughs> uh, both sorts of societies have been susceptible. Uh, and, uh, and then there are also examples where the military mobilization of society has helped uh, sort of that balance to be formed. The Swiss Confederation, I think, is a prime example which we discussed. But the conditions today are, of course, very different. What made the Swiss Confederation feasible was that 
they actually forged a system, a little bit like the Athenians, where it was the citizen soldiers. So, so the f war making actually s strengthened the citizens and, and therefore made the, uh, some of the prerequisites of the corridor much easier to maintain. That's obviously not the case. No country can really sustain itself with citizen uh, you know, soldiers today. And, uh, and therefore, we have a different dimension of war. And, and I'm sort of taking it as given in my discussion and, and, and with, with important caveats that should be emphasized more than we do in the book that, you know, all bets are off if a third world war starts. And, and, but as long as it doesn't start, I think there is enough room within that system for different countries to choose their different ways. It is true, Europe, I think, benefits from the umbrella that the U.S. creates, but it also provides Europe with much greater ability to experiment in terms of its institutions than it would have been otherwise. Thank you. We have time for at least one more question from the audience. We'll go here, but as we do, I, I'd like to ask you a question. The last time you were here presenting your previous book, yes. um, I, I asked you what is your definition of institutions because it seemed to me that it was basically an extension of Douglas North's uh, definition of the rules of the game, formal and informal, norms and attitudes and so on, and I asked uh, the, the, you to, to either confirm or explain seemed to me that some of those things, like norms and attitudes, are cultural attributes, not institutional mm -hmm. ones. And your book was very clear about the fact or about the, the assertion that uh, a nation progresses because of institutions. It's not culture, it's institutions. Yet today you're talking about uh, institutions and norms and traditions and culture have you changed your mind about these issues? No, I wouldn't say that I have changed my mind, but I've refined them. <laughs> uh, you know, the, the target that we had in Why Nations Fail was national cultures or religious cultures that were unchanging. Whereas when we're talking of norms here, it is the more the fluid element of it. But without denying that there are some national cultures, but it's just that those national cultures are molded into different things. So take, for example, the Chinese culture. It's undeniable that there are elements of Chinese culture that are distinct from Korean culture or the American culture. You know, after all, everybody in Taiwan including Taiwan, I was going to say not everybody, but including Taiwan, everybody in, in the Chinese mainland, as well as in Taiwan and Hong Kong, learned the Confucian uh, teachings that has an important element uh, in the sort of the values that they form in school and in their families. But does that mean that there is a culture of respecting authority? You know, Confucius said ordinary people don't do politics, don't debate matters of the government. So does that mean that that's what everybody who is uh, sort of uh, infused with Chinese culture accepts? And, and I think far from it. And that's what we're seeing in Hong Kong. You know, the same sort of cultural infrastructure goes in a very different direction depending on what the current balance is, what the different norms are. So for example, norms are very different in, 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 in Hong Kong in terms of what you should do as a young person in respecting authority versus not than in China. And that's, I think, is actually very important in the young people to being able to actually organize against the political authorities telling them not to do so. So all of these things, I think, are an important element of the norms. And, and certainly why nations fail was not even close to doing justice to them. And we're probably not close to doing justice to them here but we're trying to develop them, but it's still different from the national cultures. Let's take a question from you. Hi, I'm Jonathan Vekamara. I'm an intern at the American Legislative Exchange Council. I just want to thank you for bringing up norms. It's a very relevant for me because growing up in the Philippines, I realized that family, friends, and extrajudicial violence is like more powerful than political parties and the rule of law. So my question here is, um, are there other examples of countries where norms have changed that propelled liberty and prosperity forward? I think pretty much every example of the liberty being propelled forward is a movement of norms and institutions. So if you look at, for example, uh, <clears throat> the example of Lagos that I mentioned, you know, what happened in Lagos? In the 1990s, Lagos was everybody's favorite example of a hellhole. It was uh, completely falling apart. It was so crime-ridden that uh, 
you know, people would go around, you know, armed with uh, knives or guns. Uh, uh, there was no refuse collection. There was no tax collection. And nobody trusted anybody. And, and then you have this process of political and social change, which is led by a politician, but very shrewdly, the politician and the people around him, you know, they do this as a way of norm change. So you're going to, you're going to, expect a different type of life. And how we're going to achieve that, we're going to do that by, uh, by the government providing better services, but the government is going to work for you. So, so it was a whole process of changing people's expectations. As part of it, for example, Fosola, Fosola uh, you know, who was deputy mayor and then became mayor, uh, sort of gave his phone number to all the citizens that they could actually text them if they had complaints about how the government was functioning. So that was a norm change. And you see that in a several other successful examples that you couldn't change the institutions that were so dysfunctional unless you change people's expectations of them and how they get engaged with the, with the bureaucracy, with the politicians, with the police force. And that was, that was part of this thing. Now, in this case, it was leadership, meaning that somebody saw the possibility for it. But in some other cases, it actually comes bottom up. So people start protesting, they start organizing things at the local level, and that they start the process of norm changes, which uh, then is followed by institutional changes, but it's these two co-evolution of norms and institutions that's important in almost every case. Well, thank you very much. I'm afraid we've run out of time. I want to thank all of you for joining us, and I would like to especially thank Professors Nye and Asimoglu for a great discussion today. Thank you, Thanks, Ian. Thanks, John.